I am the director of the Center of Excellence uh, for Chagas Disease um, that's based in UCLA. Uh, actually, it's not UCLA. It's all of you UCLA. So it's the county facility, one of the county facilities at UCLA, uh, where we, um, we are a sa safety net hospital. So we treat a lot of Latin American immigrants. Roughly 70% of our population is Latin American. Um, we are not only the first, we got established in 2007 as a center of excellence. It's now 2017, we're still the first, we're the only, which is a sad state of affairs when you really think about it because you know, we've been really trying to push this envelope for 10 years now and it's you know, doing more research uh, more collaborations, but we obviously have a ways to go. We've done a lot of research. I'm a cardiologist. Uh, we've done a lot of research in cardiology um, based on, on Chagas, but we also have a very grassroots kind of MSF-like um, outreach program where we go into the community, we work with local churches, and we provide free sh Chagas screening. Um, it's a safe environment, so whoever tests positive then will come in to us for treatment. Um, and the CDC has been pretty instrumental in terms of helping us with our, with our screening. Um, as I mentioned, very little awareness of Chagas still in the US. Um, most people, most physicians think it's primarily a disease of Latin America. Um, we know it's a disease of the poor, and the poor are more, well, they're unrecognized in the healthcare system. Um, and we really don't know about the U.S. burden. Uh, Peter just, just had to leave, but, you know, they're starting to look at Chagas in, in hunters in Texas, for example, and in the, the vet population. And some of their findings have been pretty interesting and much higher than we, we, we thought. Um, we treat a lot of adolescents who go for their blood draws, high school blood draws, in their senior, junior and senior year, and they turn up Chagas positive. Uh, never been outside of the U.S., but here they are and they have Chagas disease. So it's here, it's endemic to the U.S., uh, predominantly in the southern states, we think. Um, I'm, I, I'm not going to go through, I, I think Colin actually touched upon this, and, and our com he's, he says he's from DNDI, but he's also from the CECD, so he works with both of us. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure you guys are aware that we have 15 species of the triatomy bug in the U.S. We have the parasite in the U.S. We think the bug behavior is a little different in the U.S. They're a little better behaved. They don't eat and defecate in the same place. They remove themselves and defecate, so lower transmission. Our housings, uh, housing conditions are better. Um, but primarily, we're not finding it because we're not looking for it. Um, and we're just starting to look at the congenital transmissions, and I think we're going to have a few people who will be talking um, on, on that this later today. Um, we just published a pretty large-scale um, prevalence study. Uh, we've had a few in the past, uh, predominantly from the Red Cross, and the one prior to the Red Cross data was in 1987, looking at 205 patients or immigrants. This is our data, the breakdown of our data. On average, 1.24%. This is strictly in Latin American immigrants looking at people who were less than 60 years of age. And we had that cut off because you can't, you can't get the drug for people over 60. Um, and at, by 60, if they don't have the complications of Chagas, they're probably not going to acquire the complications of Chagas. Um, but El Salvador, as you can see, again, almost 4%. 
prevalence, and different regions of Mexico are pretty high. Oaxaca is at 4.65%. Um, three things that really stood out when we looked at the almost 5,000 people that we screened. Education level. So the lower education level you had, the higher risk for Chagas. If you had heard of Chagas before, that puts you at a higher risk. And if you lived in, a, in housing that had either adobe or a thatched roof, that puts you at higher risk. And these are significant, I think, because you know it costs money to screen, and we may have to develop criteria as to who is at more risk of having shagas. And these can start, we can start developing criteria that can help guide us in terms of who requires screening and, and who doesn't. Um, our population, and again, this is all going to change, right, with, with the new administration. Um, Latinos in general are, are less insured. Um, they are now, being in a safety net hospital, I can tell you already, Four months into the administration, people are not coming to the hospital until they're really, really sick. We have patients that we've been following for years, who've been in this country for decades, who are contributing to society, who have houses and businesses, who are leaving because they're terrified at the, pro uh, at the prospect of, of getting arrested and having to go through the whole immigration deportation potential. So um, a lot of the information we have is from our, the Obamacare years, where a lot of people were more insured. But I'm, I'm pretty certain that that will be, we're going to be falling back to where we were six to eight to, eight to 10 years ago. Um, what we do know in terms of targeting the population, we know if we just focus on four states, we can at least get 65% of the Latin Amer American immigrant population. So again, if resources are limited, you know, we know that it's, it's Texas, California, Florida, and New York. Um, but ideally, anywhere we go in the U.S., there's a large immigrant population, and ideally we want to treat uh, those that can be afflicted. The other thing that over the course of the, the past 10 years that I've uh, been in the Chagas world that's very, very, very clear to me is we can't wait for the heart failure. We can't wait for the symptoms. It's too late. We had the benefit trial. Results came out recently. We have Fabro's data. We have Viotti's data that shows that with treatment, early treatment, you get seroconversion, and worst case scenario, you get delayed progression of disease. So what is critical to the Chagas patients is screening and diagnosing and treating as early as possible. When your heart failure has developed, and Luis Philippe was absolutely right, there's a fourfold increase of morbidity and mortality in that population, and that's comparing it to heart failure in general that has a, a terrible outcome. So if I give no message at all today, what I do want you to remember is early treatment diagnosis. Um, are critical, screening and diagnosis. I think in terms of barriers to Chagas, the number one to number 10 issue, from a physician perspective, the medical community perspective, and a patient perspective, is awareness. People don't know that they're at risk. They don't know what the disease is. Um, physicians have an hour lecture in their microbiology class on on Chagas, and I think most people that you ask about Chagas, they'll say, oh, you know, don't worry about it. You don't need to treat, okay? That's from 10 years, 20 years ago. We need to treat. And changing that 
paradigm is going to be really, really critical to our success. Um, Colin mentioned some of the socioeconomic barriers. I won't go into that. Um, this is a, the, just data on the awareness of Chagas in the U.S. Um, and as you can see across the board, it's, it's pretty low. And the Ohio study came out just last year, and 80% uh, of physicians that were surveyed um, said that their knowledge was limited. And Chagas disease is a fascinating disease. You can sit and talk to any about it, anyone about it. They will be enthralled. You walk away, and it's done. People don't, I don't know if it's a retention issue or it's, you know, they, it's still viewed as being this exotic phenomenon. But people are really interested. You know, the media gets really interested. Um, you know, pol politicians get really interested. But you leave that door and I don't know what happens. And that's where we need to really have an impact so that the conversation continues. And how do we do that? I think part of the, the discussion today is how do we advance our agenda? Um, how do we collaborate better amongst ourselves uh, to continue the momentum? We've had a slow momentum. We need to kind of get it to the next level and, and proceed with the progress that we've been making. Um, other barriers. Um, you know, aside from the, the funding issues and the insurance issues, uh, you know, this is a disease of the poor primarily in the U.S., so there are a lot of barriers as to why patients don't come and how do we make this a safe haven, a safe zone for people to come in and get treated. And we've been really successful with that because our outreach is in conjunction with health fairs that churches put on. So it's in a safe environment, and when we diagnose, when we screen and diagnose in that environment, those patients come to us because they trust that we'll take care of them. But it's going to be really interesting to see what happens in, in, the, in the future. And uh, I mentioned primary care, and by primary care, I, I mean the whole breadth of primary care, whether it's adult primary care, whether it's pediatric primary care, whether it's women's health primary care. Uh, we focus on congenital shagas and screening pregnant women. Again, we need, we need to screen them before they're pregnant, right? We need to diagnose before they're pregnant because we need to treat before they're pregnant. If we treat, I mean, the studies have shown, if you treat a woman before she gets pregnant with shagas, their offspring will not have shagas. I mean, this is kind of the epitome of primary preventive medicine. There's no other chronic condition where you can go in, get a treatment, and walk out that door, and, and for the most part, at least 80% of the part time, you can be cured. I have diabetes. I've had it for 40 years now. It's a chronic condition. It's never going to go away. Shagas we can control. We can manage. We just have to do it early. Um, we are in the process of getting a lot of primary care clinics on board for screening. And we're trying to educate. I think at UCLA, I would say most of the residents and house staff are very aware of the condition because we, you know, if you're a, a carpenter, what, everything is a hammer or a nail or whatever it is. Um, so they get a lot of exposure there. But we're, we're reaching out to the clinics that take care of uh, the marginalized population and we're providing screening there. Um, and it's... a um, you know, it takes a lot of effort, a lot of lectures that we're giving. Um, but Peter mentioned the, the HIV model of the 80s where activism really took hold and really made an impact. And when you talk about a marginalized population, they don't speak up. 
They don't speak out. They're not demanding. Whatever you do for them, they greatly appreciate. But I don't know how to invoke activism in this group. And, you know, we've been trying for 10 years. Um, but that's, that's, I think, an area of, of, of education and awareness and focus that we need to concentrate on also. Um, and there, there are different groups in different sectors across the U.S. where we're starting to do the primary care screening also. Um, and I think we all need to expand that network to really have a wider impact. Um, future needs. Future needs are the same as the past needs, right? We need more screening. We need um, early screening. We need to be treating these patients. Uh, there's no point to do screening if you're not going to treat. And we do not go to any other community outside of LA County because we can't treat them. Um, we need better drugs. But in the interim, let's use what we have. Let's get what we have approved. Uh, we need benzinidazole, absolutely. But a lot of people don't tolerate benzinidazole. We need nifurtamox also. We need to get both drugs approved. And I think until we get the drugs of FDA approved, we're really not going to have a huge impact over the course of time. I think it's critical to make access to the drugs easily readable. Uh, accessible. Um, yes, we do need better drugs, but let's focus on what we have now, because what we have now, you know, every trial that comes up with a new agent, you know, is inferior to benzinidazole. So in the interim, let's, let's use what we have and get it FDA approved. Um, diagnostic testing is another issue that I can spend hours on. Um, it's inadequate and we need better diagnostic testing and tools. Um, and the whole process needs to be easier um, and more efficient and more accurate as we, as we move forward. Um, so as we, as we go forward, we're, as we're seeking to have these better tools and treatments, we, we need to be using what we have now we can't put this on hold while we're trying to develop other things. Thank you. <laughs>